everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Innovative Approaches to Biomarker Discovery in the Drug Development Process. This webinar is a part of the Drug Discovery and Development 2022 event. I am Liz Pitts of Nanostring, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Nanostring. For more information about Nanostring, including their spatial biology platform being featured here today, please go to nanostring.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using the new live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the right of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you do have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you can click on the help desk button located at the bottom of your screen within the navigation bar or from the lobby. Finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits link located in the abstract window below the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. And now um, I'm gonna to present today's speaker, Dr. Esperanza Anguiano, Scientific Market Development Director of Biopharma at Nanostring Technologies. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the left of your screen. And with that, Dr. Anguiano, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Liz, for the introduction, and I'm honored to participate in today's event. As Liz mentioned, the title of my presentation is The Innovative Approaches to, discovery by, to Biomarker Discovery in the Drug Development Process. And today I will speak to you about the use of Geomics Spatial Biology Platform to innovate biomarker discovery and development. Nanostring business is focused on building tools for biomarker discovery and translational research. The company was founded in 2003 from technology out of the Institute of Systems Biology, and it is headquartered in Seattle, Washington. The company has over 700 employees globally and have deep expertise in the life sciences tools and are leaders in the spatial biology technology space. Our two main instrument products are displayed in this slide, and our technologies have been featured in over 4,000 peer-reviewed publications. And although our primary focus is not, is not diagnostics, we do have a history in developing diagnostic products as is featured by the Prosignia for breast cancer. Today, I will provide you with a brief introduction to biomarkers and why these are so critical in the drug development space. I will discuss some of the current biomarker strategies and challenges in doing this type of work. Then I will review a number of case studies to demonstrate how our genomics platform has already created significant impact and has revolutionized biomarker discovery across all facets in the drug development process. So why are biomarkers so important in the drug development process? Biomarkers serve as a point of reference in measuring biological processes. They represent healthy and disease states, and this can be used to measure response to exposure or response to therapeutic intervention. Biomarkers are already part of everyday clinical practice. I'm sure that when you've gone to the doctor's office, they likely measure your blood pressure, measure your weight, perhaps taking your temperature and weight, and so and possibly run some blood tests. All these are examples of biomarkers that are assessed to evaluate your health, and some of them are also monitored for certain diseases. In drug development, biomarkers are essential and have a great potential to deliver on the precision medicine promise, and it does so by identifying patients that will benefit from therapeutic intervention. And so this is, these are very critical because they can improve the success rate in drug development and have the potential to demonstrate efficacy faster than conventional approaches. Given all these points, Nanostring's proven spatial biology technology offers high opportunities for biomarker discovery. 
It enables hyplex protein and whole transcriptome scale profiling of distinct, distinct regions of tissue microenvironments using very small amounts of sample. And it also affords you the robust, reproducible, usable data that has already been that has already accelerated scientific discoveries as evidenced by the number of published research studies using our technology. Scientists in biopharma are constantly formulating a biomarker strategy with their cross-functional teams. No matter where they sit in the R&D organization, whether in discovery, preclinical, translational, or clinical space, they will be defining a biomarker strategy to meet regulatory demands for a drug. And they might also be defining an exploratory biomarker strategy that will provide them with the most biological insight. This discovery or exploratory activities in the biomarker studies opens the door for creative and innovative approaches. Nanostring geomix technology fits well in this context. There are a number of biomarker categories, and of the biomarkers being explored, whether used to meet a regulatory milestone or as part of an exploratory strategy, they fit into one or more of the biomarker categories that are listed on the right side of this slide. The specific approaches to biomarker discovery is dependent on the drug development stage and the specific insight needed to be gained. Under each of these steps in the drug development continuum that are listed in these green arrows, I have listed the specific insight that is generally sought. The type of biological sources for these studies and biological assays will vary depending on the stage of the development. Because of the different uh, sources of samples and the types of assays that are being used, this can present significant challenges. For instance, biomarkers discovered in the early stages of drug development are often derived from experimental models. This means that the results from these studies must be sufficiently robust to ensure they validate and are in impactful in the later stages of development. Uh, biolytical methods can also be a concern, in, especially in the early stages of drug development, where, they're not be so, they, where they may not be so robust. Analytical verification of methods can help improve this process. Another challenge comes from clinical samples. There is a lack in standardization in the collection, processing, and storage of these samples. Samples are often limiting, and this hinders the execution of biomarker plans. If not managed well, these challenges can significantly slow down the biomarker development progress. In this presentation, I would only focus on spatial biology approaches to biomarker discovery in this in this presentation. In this application, we focus on profiling RNA and protein in tissues. Spatial biology is more than a buzzword. With spatial transcriptomics having been declared the method of the year in 2020, and spatial biology as one of the technologies to watch in 2022, there is no doubt that the spatial biology is a new frontier in molecular biology. Special biology uses in situ based approaches to study the cellular composition and function within the tissue's own two or three dimensional context. Especially, special biology technology helps to map the spatial architecture of a cell and how it interacts with its, with its environment. Geomics does this through specially profiling RNA and protein expression. In simpler terms, in special biology studies, we're trying to understand how tissues are put together, how they are organized. We adopted the concepts and images by Dr. Aviv Rajev from the Broad Institute to represent what special biology offers. In bulk genomics, we take chunks of tissue, mix everything together to make a homogeneous solution, and then generate data from this. Signals from this represented cells can be easily disappeared. As technology has evolved, 
So using single cell approaches, we learn how much information we have been missing. We can resolve cell clusters, but we still don't know how these cells were organized and how they interact as a unit. More recently, using high-plex spatial biology tools such as Geomix CSP, we are now able to put all this information in context. We can see a positional mass of cells, and by profiling their protein and gene expression, we should be able to better understand not only how these cells are put together, but also understand how they interact with each other. And for me, this is very exciting. The special characterization of biomarker modalities have been shown to be more effective. Data published in this study demonstrated that high-plex spatial data are better or more effective approaches for predicting response to checkpoint blockade. Here we're showing a, a rock plot, and it's showing that the uh, multiplex immunohistochemistry is superior relative to the other biomarkers. And those were included single-plex immunohistochemistry, CMB, and gene signatures. Another study published by Merck comparing an 18 gene signature measuring tumor inflammation to PD-01 showed superior performance in predicting response to PD-1 blockade in head and neck tumors. This 18 gene signature was called JEP by Merck and has become to be known by many as as a tumor inflammation signature, or TIST. The same TIST assay, which by the way, was developed by Nanostring in collaboration with Merck, showed that this, the TIST score predicted clinical benefit. Merck generated bulk gene expression from FFP samples from patients participating in the clinical study. They used the Nanostring Encounter platform and came up with an 18 gene signature, or JEP biomarker, that was used as predictor of response to PD-1 blockade. Results from the study are depicted in this scatter plot. In the x-axis, you can see the T scores represented, and the y-axis represents progression-free survival measured in days. The red dots represent patients that met complete clinical response or partial response. And you can see most of the red dots fall on the right side of the, or area of the plot with higher TIS values. This means that most tumors that showed benefit from the treatment have high tumor inflammation. The blue dots represent patients with stable disease that did not meet clinical response, but have high TIS values. By focusing on the black dots along the x-axis, you can appreciate that not all inflamed tumors respond to therapy. And, and that non-inflamed tumors rarely respond. So based on the results from the Merck study, we know identification of inflamed tumors is necessary, but not sufficient for predicting response to immunotherapy. We now understand that there are different tumor immune phenotypes. The images on the left side depicts an immune excluded tumor, and the image on the right side depicts a highly inflamed tumor. Based on bulk gene expression profiling used to generate tumor inflammation signature scores depicted in the, in the circles with values, it, this shows that both tumors yield high TIS scores. The localization of immune cells depicts different tumor biology, as you can appreciate in the enclosed circles. And this suggests that bulk or single cell analysis cannot accurately profile tissue biology and that spatial context is important. Given the cellular heterogeneity in tissue samples and the ever-expanding combination of therapeutic strategies, there is a critical need to gain the most biological information possible from limiting amounts of clinical samples. With the growing focus and appreciated value of spatial information, and the limitations with current spatial technologies, researchers are used to trade off high-plex assays for low-plex spatial assays. High-plex expression profiling, such as RNA-seq, provides a lot more benefit in high context of plexing level, quantitative readout, and precision compared to, compared to low-plex 
imaging, such as immunohistochemistry assays. And these are often, uh, they, they offer a special benefit, but often they do not offer the quantitation, the plexing level, or the precision benefit that high plex assays do. So this leaves researchers to generate a lot of data with no spatial context. In order to generate both high-plex and low-plex spatial data from their samples, scientists must consume significant amounts of tissue samples and often risk not, able to, not being able to generate any data using standard approaches. Understanding the limitations that clinical research scientists are faced with and that their goal is to get as much information from their research samples as possible, spatial biology tools offer a great solution. Geomic CSP enables scientists to generate as much information as they want using high-plex spatial RNA and protein assays. This approach offers interrogation of over 100 protein markers and up to 18,000 RNA targets using very small amounts of sample. And by the way, very soon we will have, we will make available a new workflow that will enable the measurement of both protein and RNA on the same tissue section. So stay tuned for more news on this. There has been some debate as to the level of resolution spatial biology technology should have. In my opinion, spatial biology requires tools at three distinct spatial scales. For multicellular analysis, geomics is the ideal platform. You can use a variety of morphology-guided ROI selection strategies to profile relevant biology of cells in an area as small as 100 microns. For single cell or subcellular scale, the spatial molecular imager is a perfect solution, offering resolution as low as 10 micron to profile single cells and as long as one micron to profile subcellular structures. The spatial molecular imager is a new platform and will become commercially available later this year. Together, these two technologies platforms can help accelerate your research in biomarker discovery. You can use geomics as a discovery tool to generate robust data sets from your tissues or interest or your tissues of interest and enable new discoveries. You can sample as many or as few regions or areas of interest as required by your experimental plan. You can use scalable and customizable panels to ensure protein or RNA to, 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 to measure protein or RNA expression. And you can compare and contrast cellular composition in different tissue compartments and generate hypotheses as to their function and interactions. If your research needs require single resolution, the spatial molecular images enables your success enabling RNA and protein profiling at single cell and subcellular resolution for up to 1,000 targets, or 1,000 genes. So how do we generate all these robust spatial data? First, samples undergo staining using UV photocleavable oligos and fluorescent antibodies for the protein assay, or they undergo staining with UV photocleavable oligos in RNA scope probes for the RNA assay. After staining, the slide is imaged, and the image is analyzed using the system's computer interface and software. This selects regions or areas of interest according to, the experiment, to your experimental plan. Once regions of interest are selected, the automated process in the system will take over to eliminate and UV cleave oligos one ROI at a time. Immediately after being cleaved, oligos are collected and dispensed into a 96 well microtiter plate. After processing all regions of interest, the samples are processed to be read out on an encounter instrument or for sequencing on an Illumina sequencer. Data collected from each ROI can then be analyzed and visualized. Following this workflow, one can reveal morphology or biological, or, or biological compartment-specific expression profiles. In this example, a masking strategy was applied to profile a total of 10 areas of interest. 
areas one through five collective areas of the tumor in association with invasive margin. margin. Area six through nine collected areas of the tumor center and area 10 was collected to represent normal non-neoplastic tissue. Because of the masking strategy use, the total number of data points derived from this experiment is 20. Each area yields two data points, allowing you to compare and contrast two different morphologies with two different individual tissue compartments. There are a number of ROI selection strategies that can be used depending on your scientific question. You can follow a geometric or you can select a geometric strategy to use for uh, defining the heterogeneity of expression in different regions of a tissue. You could also use segmentation, which I just discussed, uh, to evaluate the expression profile of distinct biological compartments. There's also a cell type specific contour and gridded, gridded options that are available to you for use depending on the best approach to address the scientific questions that you need to address. Our genomics protein panels offer great flexibility in the biology and number of targets you can interrogate. You can measure over 140 protein targets that are relevant in cancer and immunology research studies. The content is partitioned into functional modules so that you can pick and choose what is relevant for your experiment. There are also over 100 protein targets that are relevant in neuroscience research, and the content is also partitioned into functional modules. We have partnered with APCAM, and, uh, and this gives you access to over 6,000 antibodies that you can include in your assay as custom content. I want to highlight that there's a workflow that is depicted at the bottom of this slide. We have defined best practices that users, that users can follow in order to ensure high quality results from customer, customized content using, used in their research studies. In, in terms of RNA content, there are three panels that are available. And two out of the three panels are read out on Illumina sequencers. The whole transcriptome panel is available for both human and mouse and target over 18,000 genes. The internal verification experiments have shown high sensitivity and specificity for this assay. The assay is highly robust. As we can see on this chart, you can easily detect over 6,000 genes in ROI sizes of as small as 100 microns. The Cancer Transcriptome Atlas is another panel that surveys over 1,800 genes across more than 100 pathways. And then the RNA immune pathway panel is our smallest panel consisting of about 80 targets and reads out in the encounter system. All panels are customizable. You can add anywhere from 10 to up to 30 targets of interest. So the geomics platform can take your precious clinical samples, build expression profiles for segments, and extract interesting information. But a modern platform needs to be more than this. Our approach has been to have an open design that encourages interrogation of metadata with spatial information. This allows users to input various pieces of information into the analysis workflow. Gene expression signatures could be incorporated, for instance. Images from other platforms can be used to inform regions of interest selection. This is a nice feature to have. You can use your existing immunof immunofluorescence reagents to obtain images that can be superimposed on serial sections to select your regions of interest. This can be very powerful and get studies started much faster. You can also include clinical annotations, for example, to, st to streamline your data analysis process. The geomics software includes a data analysis pipeline that can be used to generate and visualize results, as well as to generate publication-ready graphics. Data files are interoperable, allowing users to also use whatever informatic tools they have access to. 
our platform has been supported or has supported many research studies. As early as, early as of this month, we would reached our, our 100th publish, publication milestone, and this keeps growing. There is no better attestation to the performance and quality of data for any technology platform than the, than the number of high impact research paper they can derive in a short timeline. And we're very proud of this fact. There are multiple research uh, fields taking advantage of our spatial technology. The oncology and infectious disease research field have contributed the largest proportion of publications, as you can see in this pie chart. You can also see the, that many disease areas that have been studied by each of these research fields in, the, in, in these publications. This is a great attestation that our technology can generate high value across many tissue types and disease areas. And to be clear, the content analysis presented here is based on research papers only and does not include supporting publications such as reviews and other types of publications. So where in the drug development process can spatial biology make the most impact? Because the technology requires a very specific sample type, solid tissue or tissue microarrays, our spatial biology technology could impact just across, yeah, just, just about anywhere across the entire drug discovery process. To name a few applications, in the discovery process and the discovery and preclinical research stage, geomics can be used to target for target discovery, characterization of disease models, and mechanisms of action, or, or understand the mechanism of action. In translational research, the technology can be used to help generate data sets for deep characterization and profiles of clinical samples that may not be associated with a clinical trial but are used to derive insight about disease and drug me mechanism of action. In the clinical development stage, the best application besides the usual pharmacodynamic studies could be reverse translational studies. Going back to analyze samples for which there are clinical metadata, including outcome data. And this can be used to explore predictive biomarkers for patient selection and start to generate hypotheses for alternative therapies according to response status. The case studies that I will review next demonstrate how geomics can predict clinical efficacy faster and how this in turn can help accelerate the drug discovery process. Well, I've selected a, a total, you know, a few samples that I will give you a very high level overview to demonstrate application in preclinical studies, translational research, in activities in reverse translation. These are two examples representative of the type of studies that geomics could enable in the discovery and preclinical research areas. First, on the left panel, this is a study conducted by a group at the Jackson Labs. Geomics whole transcriptome and protein assays were used to characterize a specific Alzheimer's mouse model. As you're aware, characterization of experimental models is a requirement to ensure one can trust the data generated from research studies conducted in these models. Here, using the mouse whole transcriptome assay, investigators were able to confirm upregulation of disease-associated microglial genes in the expected tissue morphologies in this knockout, in this knock-in model. Then on the right panel, this is a study conducted by a group at Vanderbilt University. Geomics was used to study sting agonist response in the B16 melanoma mouse model, and they identify S100A9 and B7H3 as possible immune escape mechanisms. I'm not showing that data. By evaluating protein expression in different morphological compartments in the tumor from these models and associating values to survival, this group was able to demonstrate improved survival using sting agonist alone compared to the control and even better survival in the animals treated with a combo approach, including the sting agonist and immune checkpoint blockade. 
So these two are good examples of, exa of, of, of studies that you would carry out in this a particular discovery and preclinical space. This next uh, study uh, is another example that was conducted by the IH3 Biomedicine Group. This is a good example of how genomics can be used to characterize specific compartments of the tissue microenvironment and to elucidate key molecular characteristics of disease. This group set out to investigate the immune contexture of tumor and stroma in PPAR gamma high muscle invasive bladder cancer samples. They were able to con confirm the expected T cell exclusion phenotype in PPR gamma high that you can see in the first image on the left hand side. And they were also able to confirm the infiltrated tumor phenotype that is expected to, to occur in PPR gamma low tumor subtypes. And that's that image on the right side. As, can, uh, as, can, as you can see in the image represented here, um, the tumor subtypes are associated with the TIS values that are also represented in the uh, upper uh, corners for each of the images in the circles. And the protein expression data for CD3 for each uh, subgroup and tissue compartment was also as expected, as you can see in the bar chart on the right hand side. To better understand the immune exclusion phenotype, this group tested the tumor AOIs of PPR gamma high and PPR gamma low patients to see whether there were other markers differentially expressed in these samples. At the protein level, on the left side, geomics DSP distinctly shows differential expression of immune cell markers for the different bladder tumor subtypes. As you can see on the left side of the heat map, the expression of immune markers are less abundant as depicted by the blue color. In ROIs collected from the tumor regions of PPR gamma high samples, and that's as to be expected. On the right hand side of the heat map, the ROIs from tumor regions of PPR gamma low have higher expression of immune related markers, also as expected, and that's depicted by the red color. We can also appreciate a cluster in the middle of the heat map with ROIs that show varying degrees of expression for different immune cell markers. So this is an interesting finding. The volcano plot on the right is showing results from the same areas of interest in the two tumor subtypes. Reproducing the same immune representation in PPR gamma low and confirming the expected RNA expression values for the PPR gamma high tumor subtypes. As already highlighted in clinical studies, each tissue section uses critical. It, 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 each tissue section used is critical to the overall study design because the physical samples are usually very small. As such, prioritizing experiments often leaves key questions of biomarker studies to go unanswered. And so the second objective for this study was to determine if geomics was a viable option for studies that had limiting sample amounts. In bladder cancer, molecular subtyping is known to impact patient outcomes. And so therefore, this was important for this group to establish. They took advantage of the flexibility of the assay and customized the content to include several genes in the RNA expression panel that was used to test the capacity of geomics DSP to capture this biology. Using a single slide for tumor samples that had been previously subtyped using RNA sequencing, Geomics was able to accurately subtype luminal and basal muscle, muscle invasive bladder cancer samples. The heat map on the right is showing the results of unsupervised hi hierarchical clustering of ROIs profile using, custom, using a custom gene set that was spiked into the standard RNA panel. Besides the, su the suitability for discovery and development of biomarkers for patient selection, this study demonstrates the robustness and reliability of the data generated by the genomics platform. And this was using very small sample amounts. This study also suggests that results generated using genomics 
could likely be translatable for developing assays in standard platforms. Another important category of biomarkers is drug development. In drug development is predictive biomarkers. And this study published by David Rain's lab at the Yale uh, University demonstrates the advantage of the genomics platform and the unique opportunity this type of, repre this, this re this type of represent retrospective analysis represents in drug development. This study used tissue microarrays from baseline biopsies to determine if digital spatial profiling could reveal novel predictive biomarkers, either singularly or in combination across multiple biological compartments of the tumor and its immune microenvironment. They use a masking strategy to enrich for tumor cells or CD68, CD68 cells in the, in the areas of interest. And that's depicted in the right hand side of this slide. They profiled the expression of 44 proteins in, morph in morphological context across 59 patients that, underwear, that underwent immune checkpoint inhibition therapy. Analyzing results for association with patient outcome, they found several probes, primarily in the stromal compartment, were associated with patient outcome. These are listed on the table in the upper right uh, quadrant of this slide. PDL1 showed strongest association with overall survival in the CD68 compartment, and B2M in the CD45 compartment was associated with both progression free survival and overall survival, with strongest association with PFS in CD45 compartment. This study demonstrates that the value of, comp of, the, of compartment masking to reveal mechanistic, me mechanistically rational associations with clinical outcomes. So it once again proves the value of the spatial resolution of these biomarkers. If bulk analysis had been run, these associations may have been missed due to the fact that the majority of tissue on, on, on most slides was tumor and the meaningful associations were in non-tumor regions. Importantly, this study further highlights how genomics can enable meaningful investigations with limited patient samples. In conclusion, I hope that I have convinced you that nanostring spatial biology technology, Geomics DSV, offers reliable and innovative biomarker discovery solutions. These are applicable at every step of the drug development continuum. In basic and early discovery or in, in basic and early development studies, through the use of hyplex protein and RNA options available for human and mouse, you can find new discoveries. In translational research studies, you can generate deep characterization of clinical samples. And in clinical studies, beyond the standard biomarker analysis, reverse translational activities are low-hanging fruit. All of these can benefit from high-plex, customizable, scalable content, highly reproducible data, translatable results, and by this I mean uh, results that could easily be translated to clinical facing assays or technologies. You can get the most biological insight from clinical samples using very small amounts of sample. And it maximizes, it maximizes success and increased speed in drug development to impact patients' lives. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anguiano, for joining us today and for sharing your insights into both biomarker discovery as well as spatial biology. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. All right, let's get started. First question for you. What types of studies would benefit most from spatial profiling? The type of studies that would benefit more from spatial profiling are those where a lot of research has already been conducted, for instance, and you have identified the specific biomarkers that haven't been very successful in uh, proving 
to have clinical utility. I think the example that we gave here today with PDO1 is a good example. So by including the spatial context in the research, this group was able to bring value to PDO1 in the context with spatial context to elucidate a predicted value. Great. Second question for you here. When would you recommend looking at each type of analyte? Are there areas where RNA or protein would prove most insightful? Um, I think it's, it, it, each um, target offers different type of information. And in combination, you probably get a, mu a much better picture. RNA profiling, is, it, is, it gives you highest um, content. So you have higher, much more information that you can derive from a sample. And you can predict, you can generate hypotheses about uh, specific pathways that, that you could potentially then test on, for instance, the uh, protein assay to, to ensure that the transcriptional expression is really representative of the uh, translational aspect of uh, the functional process for the cells, with, uh, which is through the protein expression. All right, it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, final question for you. The ability to select ROI seems like a powerful tool that can enable scientists to ask very precise and customized questions in their research. Can you share any insight into the benefits of using geometric ROIs or taking a segmentation approach, for example, when designing your studies? Sure. So there are benefits to using a geometric approach. The best, um, you know, the best benefit would be that you have a better ability to control the size uh, of the of the or or the composition of the tissue within the ROI section. So, for instance, you might find tissues where the cell density might vary, and so by having the ability to use uh, a, 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 a geographical or geo, a geographic, geometric, I'm sorry, ROI, you have the ability again to control the specific content that you're collecting. While segmentation approaches are valuable, uh, those might inhibit your ability to control, for instance, the representation of the morphologies that you're measuring in that space. Uh, but those are important things to keep in mind, especially how you're ultimately going to normalize and analyze your data. Excellent. And um, with that, I would like to thank you again so much, Dr. Aguiano, for your time today and for sharing your knowledge with us. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their extremely interesting questions. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Nanostring, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that they provided at the time of registration. This uh, webcast can be viewed on demand for two years, so that will be until February of 2024, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And until next time, goodbye.